Welcome to uh, IPSS, International Association for Political Science Students, Political Theory Virtual Seminar. And this virtual seminar, I'm going to be moderating, and I'm Thomas N. Singway. We're going to be discussing introducing African political thought, themes, and debates. Nowadays, we hear a lot of stuff about race and racial consciousness, the intellectual debate about the Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Movement all across. What is it about African political thought? It's actually been a marginal part of uh, political philosophy. And it has been situated mostly between cosmopolitan political thought and comparative political theory. But most scholars have debated that comparative political theory stresses more on though it considers uh, other sort of political thought, other versions of political theory, but it takes into not much consideration in the, the internal philosophical method of these other versions of political theory that are not Western political thought. So it is situated right between cosmopolitan political thought and comparative political theory. So for African political thought, what is it about African political thought? What is it about African political philosophy? I'm going to use Bernard Craig's uh, three levels of analysis, political thought, political theory, and political philosophy, but it's going to be all inclusive. I'm going to discuss African political thought, representing African political philosophy, and everything that it constitutes. African political thought uh, refers to the regional values and ideas for a better Africa. It's a branch of political philosophy that discusses Africa, and that discusses the systems of Africa, that discusses thinking of Africa and how Africa approach enduring political questions. What makes this even more interesting is that for African political thought, it has been at the marginal level of political philosophy. It has been at a less talked about position where you check most of the political theory courses across the world. You barely see a course in African political thought and African political philosophy. Because uh, for most scholars, especially Western scholars, this branch of political philosophy has not been considered based on different fronts. Number one, people consider African political thought or Africans themselves or the African race, I can say, not to be much of rigorous thinkers, which is actually a very stereotypical position and absolutely wrong. African political philosophy, people never had the idea that African, Africans could even think philosophically, could analyze philosophical questions. So for so long, there has been real debates about what uh, African political thought should be included within the canon of, of political philosophy. So it's a neglected field of study. Uh, though African indigenous system for so long has had philosophical ideas and uh, philosophical consciousness, but not much has been studied for a long period of time. And it emerged as a field of study in the late 1960s. That was at the, at the advent of the anti-colonial movements. And by the 1960s, 1970s, we saw huge rise in, in, in African resisting Western colonialism on the continent. So that gave birth to African, that gave rise to the momentum of African political thought. So it has been for that for quite a long period of time. So by the 1960s, African scholars and intellectuals who had probably been schooled either outside of the continent or in the continent have started to reconsider political questions. And they tried to create a distinct discipline separate from Western political thought because probably most of the time prior to 1960 has been the time where Western political thought had been on the front of political philosophy. But for Africans, they saw African intellectuals and scholars saw the need to reshape the discipline of political philosophy, especially from the African angle, considering African political thought as a distinct version of political philosophy with its own epistemology, ontology, and everything that it consists of. And what makes African political philosophy more interesting is that for African political thought and political practice in Africa, they are completely connected. So political thoughts of African leaders and, and African philosophers, African thinkers, actually influence African institutions and African politics. So there is actually no real blur line between African political thought and African institutions. Though scholars might consider some, but is actually a very thin line. African political ideas have tremendously over the period of years shaped African institutions. And African political thought can be classified. There are categories through which African political thoughts can be placed into. And we divide these categories into two. We have indigenous uh, political thought and modern African political thought. 
for indigenous political thought to develop during the, the age of the empires in Africa, we had the Egyptian civilization, the Nubian Empire, the Axuma Empire, the Ghanaian Empire, the Songhai Empire, the Malian Empire. And that was between the 12th and the 16th century. These were the golden ages of African history. And indigenous African political thought developed along that time based on indigenous ideas, the original inhabitants of, of this continent. And about that same time, and in the late 19th century, 20th and early 20th century, we saw the rise of uh, modern African political thought. So there's a distinction between indigenous African political thought and modern African political thought. Indigenous African political thought lay emphasis on historical ideas, indigenous systems, but while modern African political thought developed by men like uh, Bladen, James Africanus, Bialy Hordon, Kwame Nkrumah, and others, these were all modern people who had ideas quite different from, and characteristics that fed African institutions quite different from what these indigenous systems were. For modern African political thinkers, they were influenced by the tragedy of slavery and colonialism and all of these things. They had just returned from from, in fact, they have been on slavery for quite a long time. They are just returned from the bondage of slavery and they're suffering from racism and all sorts of degradation, human degradation. So all of these factors play a role in the formation of modern African political thought. While for indigenous African political system, before the Europeans eventually came to Africa, there were already African institutions. So there's no way any European scholar can allege that Africa is, is actually a historical. Africa is not a historical because we have system, we have political institutions, we have philosophical beliefs which were based on rigorous thinking before the, the Europeans came to Africa. And some might even contest that these people could not read and write. But this is another argument. These people thought and they organized themselves. They had their own distinct form of political organization, their own distinct form of civil life, and they had original thoughts about how institutions to be considered. So if you look at political philosophy from the angle that it should only be considered how Western methods and on what condition Western methods were stipulated, then we will overlook African political institutions. Because Western methodologies cannot be used to explain the formation of African political institutions because they are part of two different civilizations. So rigorous political thought from one area it's quite different from rigorous political thought from another institution and from another civilization. And we have lists of some prominent African, indigenous African political thought, prominent African indigenous political thinkers. We have Tahute. Tahute was an Egyptian political thinker. And uh, he had a maxim of uh, Tahute. It was actually, he wrote more on political ethics. He, more, he wrote more on uh, political organization. And he was, he actually predated most of these Grecian philosophers. So he was, a, he was almost like a contemporary or probably predating Aristotle and Plato and Socrates and the rest of them. But much of these has not been talked about. He was, he is an historic figure in Egyptian civilization. Egyptian civilization is one of the, the world's earlier civilization. It has contributed much to humanity. So when Joe William Frederick Hedger argued that we cannot consider African philosophy because Africa has not con contributed anything to, to world's history or, or to, to any civilization across the world. That is absolutely wrong. These were people who led serious intellectual movement in their time and contributed towards understanding the way we see it. So Eurocentric analysis of African political institutions must be taken away in order to really understand what African political philosophy is. We can never understand African political philosophy from the context of Western political methodology. We understand African political philosophy from the African context. So we had Leo Africanus, he was one of them. He was an Andalusian, he was a verbal Spanish thinker. He wrote a description of Africa. He contributed much to understanding the indigenization of African institutions. So he studied much, he traveled much across Africa and he studied African institutions and how these areas were organized and he thought about them and wrote on ethics across African institutions. Abakri was a Ghanaian scholar and he also had an Islamic background and he wrote much about uh, African civil life and he contemplated on ways these uh, 
normal indigenous society are stratifying how their structure across line have been patrolled. And for those who are famous with, with Islamic political thought, we know the name Abin Kadon. Kadon wrote much about uh, political philosophy because when Kadon, which was actually a wanderer or nomadic figure, when he came across the sub-Saharan African belt, Kadon had the opportunity to meet most of these empires that were already on the Western belt of Africa. So he had a chance to visit the Malian Empire, the Ghanaian Empire. So he studied their systems. So lack of understanding of African indigenous system has caused all the Western scholars to just totally disregard African institutions. So he took his time to study the African institutions and he promulgated essential philosophy and that is very pertinent to how political organization works across the continent and for how political authority. He's a figure when it comes to political authority in Africa, understanding political authority, philosoph philosophizing about political authority. And for modern African political thinkers, those from the uh, late 19th century and uh, early 20th century, those who led the African Renaissance and Nationalism Movement, we had Edward Wilmer the Blood, and these are just some of them, but they are more who contributed to modern African political thought. We had Edward Wilmer Blood, a thesis of the African personality, regenerating Africa, regenerating the African spirit, trying to distinguish Africa from beyond the bondage of Western civilization and trying to rejuvenate the African mind, sort of like that. We have James Arikana Bialeo Horton. Horton postulated the theory of African constitutionalism. That was African self right movement. He based his theory mostly on the British governance system, but yet he had a distinct portion of indigenizing uh, African constitutionalism, which was actually fantastic, Franz Fanon the post-colonialist thinker. He contributed much to understanding the post-colonial dialectics, understanding Africa and African identity. And what most modern African political thinkers have been occupied with over a period of time has been trying to understand the African identity. What is the African identity? That has been questioned about rediscovering the African identity. You have W.E.B. Du Bois, William Ed Edward Burger Du Bois. Du Bois was a leader of the Black movement in America. He he wrote he was an American sociologist, but he has a, he had an African American background. He moved, he wrote much about Africa, much about the African race. He wrote a book called The Sue of the Black Folk that's influenced the way we think about the African identity. We have uh, Martin Luther King, the famous civil rights activist, and his uh, passive non-resistance movement that tried to give value to black lives and value to the way we approach issues of Africans and African Americans and Africans in the diaspora. We had Leopold Sida Senghor. Senghor was actually a, a Senegalese thinker. And he started a negative movement, which was actually from the literary school, African political philosophy, rejuvenating Africa through African literature. Julio Kambaragini Rebe, he was an African political thinker from Tanzania. And he postulated the theory of Ujamaa or African socialism, quite distinct from the socialism of the East of Europe. So African socialism was based, was based on the idea of the African communal system that we are all one, the John Batiste said, Ubuntu, I am because we are. So definitely the idea of Africa is that we are together. It is not individualism but rather communalism. So when we think about Africa and African system, we don't think about Africa just as based on individual values, though individual values are important. But African society is structured around the state itself as an organic body and not just individuals being above the state. So we had Nelson Mandela and what uh, most modern African thinkers would try to term is political philosophy and empathetic cosmopolitanism. We have uh, Kwame Pia, the Ghanaian thinker, and of course, Akili Mbembi and Necro Partridge. So these were all uh, in, in modern African political thinkers and they are then leading the movement across Africa. Thematic considerations. What is it about African political thought? Thematically, what does it consider? African political thought, for indigenous African political thought, it considers the indigenization of African political system, setting African indigenous system, how they operate, how these people uh, live their lives. and how societies were structured, how society ought to be structured. So it addresses both normative and empirical questions. When it comes, and it also discusses African identity and African reconstruction. 
three dialectics of African political thought. We have Aryan continent versus the diaspora. So that has been an entirely different area of research. How has uh, Africans who are in Africa related to those in the diaspora? Are the ideas of those on the continent different from those in the diaspora? That has been another area. And another point of debate has been between North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa, those of whiter skin and those of, of, of black skin. Western Africans and black skin African tradition versus modernity. So this has been essential areas of thought, essential areas of contemplation in African political philosophy. Will we consider indigenization or should we take a professional approach to African political philosophy? So that has given real rise to the role of Pan-Africanism. Pan-Africanism is a concept that was initiated way back and, uh, in African history. And the first Pan-African conference that was uh, started in 1990, that gave breath to understand that whether you're in the diaspora or in the north or the south of Africa, wherever you are as an African, we are all one. So forging one African identity was actually a platform on which even today the African Union, which is a regional continental body of Africa, was founded. Modern African political thought has been conditioned by some very important political factors, sociocultural political factors. And these are slavery, colonialism, racism, and exploitation. And they play a real essential role in which these modern African political thinkers took a different approach to political philosophy, quite different from indigenization and indigenous political thought. Because for over 400 years, they were in slavery. Then after slavery, there came the Europeans colonizing Africa. Then after colonization, Africa eventually gained independence. There came races in exploitation. So how to confront these socio-historical realities? Africans have conditioned political thought across these circumstances that they face and considering these conditions that they find themselves. For conceptual interest, African political philosophy is like any other branch of political philosophy because it takes into consideration understanding who the people are. And it takes into consideration evaluating what power is and the political organization. So if Plato and Aristotle and all of these Asian political thinkers, then Machiavelli and the rest of them were interested in understanding power and the police, understanding political organization, if these were enduring questions that form an integral part of Western political philosophy, it has also been the concern of these African political thinkers. So there is really no divide between Western political thought and denigrating African political thought because we took a different approach to understanding these quintessential questions that has for so long puzzled political philosophers. How should the police be organized? What is power? What constitutes power? What are the, the what are the dimensions of power? How can we evaluate power? How can we define power? And what constitutes a right police? What is justice? What is equality? So all of these have been important issues that African political philosophers have endeavored over the years to understand. And that has been passionately, very passionately uh, started and invigorated by something we call African nationalism. That's a sense of entitlement to Africa. So the pan-African identity distinguishes Africa and Africans from the rest of the world. We have a distinct sense of identity that we want to rediscover. For so long, slavery has tried to deny the African of their identity. Slavery, colonialism, has tried to divide the African culture. So African intellectuals and African philosophers, African thinkers have tried to reconsider how can we reconstruct the African identity. Take, for example, the issue of racism. If we take racism as being just uh, this group, it does not match up to what we are or who we are and they are lesser than we are they are lesser humans of lesser values and they are primitive they are barbarians and we are of a higher civilization that is actually laughable and very paradoxical because firstly we must consider that the african identity was marginalized by racism so for african political thinkers there needs to be a point to reconstruct the african identity because prior to slavery and colonialism there were women and african African organizations, there were booming African activities. There were a lot of different institutions in Africa before these people eventually set foot on the continent. So we need to rediscover who we are and build a distinct civilization. So African nationalism has been quite very important and has been a driving pillar in understanding African political thought. So political philosophy for Africa has been trying 
to get people to understand who we are, what we've done, and what can we contribute, and what we have contributed over the years. And there are also methods and schools of African political thought, but roughly uh, schools of African political thought falls within the same category of uh, African philosophy and methods that involve in investigating African philosophy. There are three basic methods that uh, African scholars have used in trying to understand African investigative African political ideas. And the three methods are communitarian, complementary, and conversation. And for communitarian method, it is out of mutualism. You know, Africa operates as a group and as a state. So the organic or the state itself exceeds the individual. The state itself exceeds the individual. So the individual is not above the state. For a complementary method in African political thought, we consider it from the perspective of trying to find a missing link between the Waswa and the Wanju. So you have uh, you have a point where no variable is, is, is actually left untouched. So we investigate what is indigenization, folk philosophy, or what is professionalism or African ideas, everything get together. We try to find how these variables can really play in understanding whether this idea fits the African police. We have conversational method. But the conversational method in African political thought is actually a mixture of both a communitarian and a complementary method, but it takes more like a conversational approach, wherein you find ideas being debated to find a common ground in order to promulgate these African political theories. And schools of philosophical analysis and African political thought. And there have always been debate when it comes to African political thought. Uh, how should political theory be considered? And how should political thought, how should African political philosophy be interpreted? The first school are those that we call the professionals. For the professionals, they, they do have the idea. We have men like Kosi Wasseridu and, uh, and others, and Pauline Hutonji. The been in one thinker who fall within this particular school of thought that believe African political philosophy cannot be based on folk philosophy or traditions or legends or, or oral history or what people think. It should be based on the rigor of philosophical analysis and thinking. So ideas must always be played through similar methods of Western political philosophy in order to gain a universal merit. So they try to tie African political thought alongside Western methodology for the nationalist and ideological school. These were people who were more concerned with, with following political ideologies. And we have Kwame Nkrumah with the constitutionalism theory, Nelson Mandela having their own theory. So we're more like political ideology. But for the literary school, we have people like Leopold Sidas and Goa and the others who took more like a literature approach. They wrote poems and uh, they had short stories and fictional stories that portray the African culture and the distinctiveness of the African culture. For the ethno-philosophical school of uh, African political thought, it's actually a school that was started way back trying to recreate the African identity. For the ethno-philosophical school, they believe that to understand African political philosophy and to reconstruct the African identity and to understand how African political philosophy can be relevant today in contesting all of these negative narratives against Africa. We need to dig down into African indigenous history. We need to dig down into African indigenous systems in order to understand how this polity was constructed from the very beginning in order for us to refute all negative claims against Africa. For the conversational school, they try to weigh between and find the common ground. For the hermeneutical school, they believe they believe that in order to interpret African political philosophy, there should be stringent and very important textual analysis. For we have to say of uh, Ethiopia, he currently teaches at Morgan State University. They have all championed this hermeneutical school that if you want to approach African political philosophy, it should be approached more from the front where we take text by text statement by statement, ideas by idea, and take a critical analysis of everything and come up whether this idea is relevant or not. So it is really difficult trying to find a position of the so-called uh, philosophers of the hermeneutical school, because they have ideas of the professional school and ideas of the ethno-philosophical school. But they have widely debunked ethno-philosophy, arguing that you cannot solely consider political philosophy just from some sort of indigenous system there must be more of a rigorous analysis. And at the same time, 
And the equality believe that the only way we can get African food values is when we study this indigenous system. So it's quite contradictory of the hermeneutical school or African political philosophy. There comes the question, is African political philosophy really political philosophy? It has been a great debate, right? And uh, mostly African political philosophy, when you read most textbooks on African political philosophy or you watch some lecture videos in most academies in the West or other areas, African political philosophy has been so wrongly categorized with, with the thinking of influential African political leaders, like we saw with uh, Mandela, Iweri, and Nkrumah. All of these were distinct African thinkers, but African philosophy is not confined into just the ideas of these anti-colonialists. No, that's not African political philosophy. If we do that, what we're doing is that we are trying to restrict the rigor of the discipline of African political philosophy. And one of uh, the quite, I can say, bizarre argument has been African political philosophy is basically about all of the changes and the dangers of African politics and just almost like a chronicle of the ups and downs of African politics. That is not African political philosophy equally. It's not just all about how Africa has spent wars and conflicts and conditions and all of these been written down about Africa. That's not African political philosophy. African political philosophy transcends just chronicling all of the problems of Africa or just postulating a theory against the West. It goes beyond that to understanding African institutions. So the debate is actually that African political philosophy, some have considered African political philosophy to be mere reactionism and againstism, or depiction of Nietzschean slave morality, that Africa blamed the West for nearly everything she suffers, for her problems, for her backwardness, for her honor development. So bulk of the issue with racial consciousness, bulk of the issue with problems in Africa and the African nationalism, African movements across the continent, have always been against Western civilization. And some have even argued in that I don't see anything important in African political philosophy because African political philosophy is just simple slave morality. It's just trying to blame the West for all of your conditions, trying to blame colonialists for what it did to Africa. More, much of the literature of Africa or African political philosophy, some Western scholars have argued, has been just about antagonizing everything about Western political philosophy. But African political philosophy was not established to antagonize the Western canon or to decanonize certain things from Western, from Western political philosophy. No. African political philosophy has a distinct mission. In fact, it is not just a way of discontent against Western philosophy. It's not just about Everything against Western philosophy, African political philosophy go beyond that. It's a pure of rigorous thinking, answering enduring political questions. So we, like I said, uh, we examine tough questions, the same questions that have been examined in Western political philosophy, but the difference is that we don't examine these concepts from the Western perspective or using Western methodologies, but these concepts have been examined using African methodologies, using an African system and African ideas. So necessarily, what these approaches and arguments have done, they have, they have deformed, reduced, and ignorant the stereotype African political philosophy. It has not given due diligence to what African political philosophy is. African political philosophy should be considered within a wider context and not be restricted to just being an antagonist of Western political thought, blaming them for everything. And another thing, uh, it deliberately ignores the perhaps uniform, uninformedly thing that African people are not worthy of thinking. In fact, when you look at what Hannah Arendt called the common world, it's actually like uh, Africans and African thinkers, group of people with a distinct set of values and ideas trying to create their own sort of system based on what they believe in. So concepts of equality and human rights and justice and development have all been considered within the African context. So it is quite wrong and, and, and very ignorant to consider Africans not to be thinkers just because they do not rationally extract to what the Western political theory say. So to conclude on this, what I basically think, African political philosophy is an interesting discipline. And it postulates a lot about who we are as a continent, what we've done, and what we've accomplished. So when you take the trend of understanding what uh, this branch of philosophy has done for 
nearly over a century or even up to today is that it is it is actually important in understanding who we are understanding the institutions of africa you can never really understand african institutions and african african states african organizations without understanding what african political philosophy is so it is a branch of political philosophy quite interesting with a lot of schools involving a lot of methods and should not be degraded thank you Uh, thank you, Thomas, for sharing. That's very interesting. Uh, uh, because of time constraints, we will not have a Q&A today, but we are going to uh, ask the people who have questions to raise it up during our next meeting, which will uh, happen in three weeks' time. So uh, but, uh, I, I have a I have a qualm, right? Yeah. Okay. I think you can allow probably two or three questions, and we can close the the this time. Okay. So uh, I. Okay, I personally cannot be here because I have a meeting, but I think uh, if uh, Jendrik or Gregor have questions, you can raise it up now. Yeah, sure. All right. Um, unless anybody else has a question. Mm, I mean, first of all, thank you very much for enlightening me, us, possibly. Um, that was really interesting. And uh, the overview was, um, well, I, I guess comprehensive. I couldn't say, but I assume you, are, uh, you were. Um, yeah, and it's always really hard to get these kinds of overviews over any particular area um, in science and in philosophy in particular, at, at least that has been my um, experience. What I wanted to question, uh, to ask, and let me preface this with, the fact that I'm like not the greatest person to ask this, these questions. Um, there, uh, whenever the um, term of identity is dropped anywhere, I get reminded of um, where critiques of really any kind of identity uh, stress movement. Um, and that isn't really my criticism though I, I see their points, but I think it can be taken to extremes where it's going against um, emancipatory movements in the same kind of well, um, arrogant and ignorant manner as the Nietzschean argument, which you know can just be dropped against any kind of moral case, and it is. Uh, you but these arguments against, against um, identitarianism. Um, how is African political thought um, approaching that? How, how is the, uh, what's the um, situation of the debate there? Because you uh, talked about, a lot about how important um, that constructing effort is. And I see that a lot. Um, I, that makes a lot of sense to me, but um, I also feel like Internationally, there's um, a lot of anti-identitarianism there at the uh, at the moment, and obviously, obviously, there's also identitarianism like white identity. Um, so, how how is um, that navigated? Thank you, thank you for that question. I think it's it's actually an important question in African political philosophy, addressing identitarianism. For the African identity, the issue with the African identity and uh, trying to reconstruct the African identity, African political philosophy uh, does not in any way an antagonize uh, Western identity. Those some African scholars have gone to the extreme. These are from different schools of African political philosophy. Why he has done over a period of time is trying, because for so long the African race has been denigrated due to slavery and races and exploitation, continuous exploitation. So trying to understand who we are as a people and to get back to our regional systems and try to build and reconfigure these indigenous systems that is on par in order to understand who we are. If we do not understand our roots as African, we will not understand exactly what we can contribute as a people. So we try to really understand Africa as a distinct civilization for the issue with uh, understanding identitarianism is that African political philosophy, African scholars for the period of time have tried to reconcile African identity and African ideas with, with, with Western identity, trying to find a common ground between 
Western identities and African identity. That's a common humanity, trying to find a cosmo cosmopolitan world where both Western identity and African identity can find just one common issue to be discussed. So it's not just about throwing wave of opinion against one side, but it's trying to find a common ground, like a conversational approach, find a common ground between Western identity and African identity, because these are all borrowed civilizations. All right, yeah, thank you. That really clears it up. Thanks. Thank you. I might have, I might have another question. Um, well, first, thank you, Thomas, for your excellent talk. It was really enlightening. I've never heard much about West, uh, about African political thought, you know, in my own university course. So that was very good to hear. Um, I had a, you, you did elaborate a little bit about um, the role of rationality um, in African political philosophy that seems to be different from Western political thought. Could you elaborate a little bit more on that, you know, where you really see the difference here, whether, you know, Western political thought is too focused on rationality? in a particular sense or what would? What... That, that has been an interesting debate. Right? When you look at the debate of the professional school of African political philosophy, the debate has been uh, African political philosophy should be more concerned about adopting rationality and the issue of rationality as, as a focal point of understanding and evaluating political ideas. For African political thinkers, they've been divided on the issue of rationality, but that's not to say that rationality is not a pillar of African political philosophy. But what basically we can do with African political philosophy or you understand African political philosophy is to understand African political philosophy from the context of how the African polity was structured from the very beginning. Western political thought lays emphasis on rationality. African political thought lays emphasis on rationality, but in a different context. And that context is, we evaluate this rational system based on how we started up as a polity, how we started up as a society. So our own form of rationality differ and methods of evaluating rationality differ from that of the West. Because we have an entirely different approach, entirely different civilization that is based on sort of values and ethics that, that originated based on the way Africans live. So rationality is not an issue of context between the West and Africa. There's, there's, there's no real point because it's the same sort of rationality, but rationality taking different approaches. One is an approach based on Western values, while the other is an approach based on African values. Okay. Um, would it be adequate to call it more communitarian, for example, instead of sort of um, liberal individualistic? Is that a good way of conceptualizing it? I'm trying to wrap my head around it, you know, in a way. Oh, definitely. I think uh, for most African political thinkers, the they took a part of communitarianism. After independence, after independence in Africa around the 1960s and 70s and 80s, we saw most African nations becoming one party states and socialists because they, they felt that socialism was more aligned with the communal system in Africa, the communitarian system in Africa. So that's why it took these one party states. But at the end of the day, these one party socialist regimes crumble and they had uh, individualism coming in and capitalism coming in and destroying everything. So for African political philosophy, it's more like the organization or the state above the individual than the individual above the state. So you are right to classify it that way. Okay. That was the perspective of most African thinkers. Cool. So there's no, there, there's no one perspective in African political philosophy, almost like Western political philosophy. There's no one perspective. So there are, diff there are, there are different perspectives, but understanding the African culture, we gave you an idea that Africa was actually a communal society. So most ideas in Africa, understand Africa will be based on a communitarian system. Interesting. Um, could you recommend any one thinker in particular, for example, that we should read, you know, not, or at least myself, not have any idea uh, about what, uh, African political philosophy? Okay, Who's definitely well. Okay, I will get back to a slide and show you. Very good. All right. Uh, are you seeing the slide? Yeah, I see it. Okay, good. Um, you find these are some really enriching African political thinkers. You have Bladen, El Oma Bladen. He's actually from West Africa, Liberia particularly. He has his Western political thought based on African personality, rejuvenating African personality. He's an essential reader on understanding Africa. We have uh, Horton, Franz Fanon, 
based in the Caribbean, we had the boys. And for understanding community realism or African socialism was actually a theory that was postulated by this fellow called Julius Kamaragini Weber. He was the president of Tanzania. He was a teacher and uh, he was a philosopher similarly. So he had this uh, Ujamaa policy. Ujamaa is actually a Swahili war for familyhood. So he believed that African decisions should be made around the palaver hall or in the table where we sit together and discuss relevant issues rather than allowing individual will to prevail over the rest of the society. So when you read and come out again, very African socialism it will give you an idea of how the politics is structured. So you can also read uh, Kwame Napier or uh, Kirum Bebe Negro politics, where you try to rediscover African identity using Foucaultian analysis. Mm. So these are all great thinkers. Okay, thanks. Well, if you need additional ones, you can contact me and we can start a conversation. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. With my reading uh, speed, I, I, I'll get to you in about two years, probably. <laughs> well, we, we expect that. And uh, thank you again for, for joining. I hope you had a nice time yeah. learning about African political philosophy and uh, trying to re restructure your perspective for how to consider African polit political philosophy as a distinct discipline of, of political philosophy. So it gives you an it gives you an entire idea of how to approach how to approach the, the issue with uh, with protests and the mm -hmm. racial movements across the world. If you do not read it, understand because it's quite different with Africa, right? With Africa, theories are tied to practical political situations. So people think mm -hmm. and act the same. So definitely, in order for you to understand how these institutions, though there are differences, I'm not saying there are not differences. There are differences. But mostly in Africa, there is an inextricable link between political thought and political practice. Mm. Interesting. Uh, hasn't really been that like that for a while in the West. The West. Stupid term. <laughs> yeah, sure. So that makes it even more more interesting. And uh, when you really yeah. uh, uh, appear as work, come in appear as work, when you read Kwesi was to work, you found bulk of the work they did in African political thought from the professional school, African political philosophy was based on more Western approach using Western methodologies and the, and the so-called regular Western methodologies to understand and evaluate African political thought. But this has been really, really amazing. They want to evaluate African indigenous system on Western methods, which has been incompatible. So in order for you to understand African indigenous system, you must use African method to evaluate these systems. It is a contextualized approach and not just a holistic unilateral approach. Yeah. Interesting. Hmm. I think the other way around though, I mean like only like, Alone, what you said about you know um, starting off not from the individual, more for instance like from a multitude or like a family, um, like that's something I feel is missing very much in Western thought, um, and that that Western philosophers are trying, at the very least since Marx, to to you know to get over and. Um, with, uh, they're struggling, right? Like um, they never um, seem to really shed that in your individual, that rational individual, um, and move on to well groups, or like only at the very, not even two people can really be considered. It's always I'm me like, and the other. <laughs> if you if you read the works of uh, Leo Strauss, I think. Gregor mm. has read significantly on Leo Strauss, right? Yeah. Mm. And if, if, if you read Leo Strauss, and he actually argued much that it is, it is actually for to to have the philosopher living apart from the world. The philosopher must live in the reality of the world. Mm. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so definitely for African political philosophy and uh, noticing the basic factors that underpin the formation of modern African political thought, African political thinkers are actually more connected to the polity. And one of the criticisms against a professional school that has adopted Western methodology has been 
do you think you can actually use this ideal way of understanding to interpret African political conditions? Because they must be interpreted within the context in which they, the African people, have been surviving and, and the conditions under which they have been placed. Mm -hmm. So there have been counter, counter arguments with understanding the position of African political philosophy. So once we understand what political philosophy is, and there's also a likelihood, and usually I get criticized for this, there's also a likelihood for African political thinkers to overemphasize ethnic philosophy. Because if you overemphasize oral tradition and folk philosophy, they have no basis in really understanding how modern institutions will function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it will be like an over exemplification of exactly what you want to do. Mm -hmm. if, everything must be subjected to some sort of rigorous analysis and it should be within context not rigorous analysis outside of the traditional context and outside of the institutional context mm -hmm. everything must be considered within its own context so when you're talking about african political thinker african political philosophy considered within the african context but with much much intellectual rigor mm -hmm. and not just 40 assumptions <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this has been really valuable. So thank you again, and I hope you read uh, about them. And uh, <laughs> hope you really read about them. And if, you, if it's possible for you to take a course in African political thought, please do take a course. But one thing you should remember, when you're taking a course in, in African political thought or African political philosophy, beware of uh, some of these false rules and some of the misinterpretations of African pol political philosophy that I just covered. Which amongst yeah. them, uh, number one, African political philosophy is just about antagonizing the West and decanonizing some Western political thinkers. No, that's not the foundation mm -hmm. of African political philosophy. Two, we must also remember that African phil political philosophy is not just about some sort of oral tradition, it involves some sort of rigorous analysis. It is not just about the thinkers or the ideologies of Marxism and Afro-socialism. No, it's not mm. just about political thinkers' ideology. It goes beyond political thinkers' ideology to examine tough, enduring political questions. How should the African society be organized? And uh, how are institutions to function? What is political authority? What is political ethics? So we examine all of these questions in African political philosophy. So it's, it's really enriching. Mm. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much. It was really cool talking to you and uh, yes. thanks for answering yes. my questions. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah, that really inspired um, a whole new branch of thinking for me. So, yeah, thank you very much. All right. I think I'll leave now. Um, yes. Bye. Goodbye. And yeah, thank you again, Jonas. <laughs>